welcome back to Sip and Spin. My name is Skylar and over here in a t-shirt with mushrooms on it with owl looking faces is Brittany. <laughs> Hello. This is a variety podcast where we talk about anything, everything, and nothing. So they kind of look like owl faces. They, yeah, I was confused when you said it, but I, I get it. I just thought more just like dead, ominous beings, but yeah. I think that works for owl faces also. <laughs> owl, just, this just in, owls are dead ominous beings. I mean, some cultures see them as omens, some as guides. It, take it tracks. It, take it as you will. Personally, I think owls are, they're cool, but they, I... Are they cool? <laughs> ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> but I personally think that they, they are bad omens. Uh, see, I am just the opposite. Sketch. I have always liked owls. How are you? I'm good. Yeah. Um, I've got family in right now. My aunt actually braided my hair. And I'm like... All right, it does yes. look very nice. And my mom cut my hair, so... Oh, okay. So it is shorter. Yes. Okay. Yes. I wasn't sure if that was just the braids or... No. Yeah. Normally my braids come down to like yeah. here. But um, I need my dead ends cut. So my mom cut my hair for me and then my aunt braided it. Cute. Yes. Now we have someone else staying with us because my cousin is going to be staying with us for a year, maybe two years. Oh. She's 17, or she's going to be 17 on, like, Friday. And oh, wow. She's going to, hopefully, we're going to see how junior year goes with her being at school with Shelby. And then, if it goes well, she will stay for senior year and just graduate from the high school here. All right. Is she a problem child <laughs> back home? Um... <laughs> Yes, but I th it's more like, you know, her and her sisters really do butt heads, and then her and her mom butt heads, but... Just a change, trying it out. Yeah, because um, my uncle is going to be going to school in Washington, and so he'll only be home on the weekends, and plus they have a new baby, so it's going to be hard for my aunt to, oh, wow. you know, with my aunt my cousin butting heads all the time to also take care of a, her yeah. baby, and then three girls. That's a lot of girls. Yeah, there's <laughs> 17, 15, 12, and the three-year-old boy. Gosh. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a lot. A lot of personality, I imagine. Yeah, but it's not like <laughs> she's a problem or anything. It's just they, they just typically butt heads, and it's going to be a lot. And so they're doing it because also I think she really enjoys like being with us because she and Shelby get along like oh, two peas in a pod. That's so. good then, yeah. Yeah. And I actually gave her a book today to read. Oh, yeah? Because she was like, I've read all the ones on my bookshelf. And I was like, haha, well, I gave Shelby this book to read, and she hasn't read it yet. So I'm going to steal it from her bookshelf because it's mine, and I'm allowed to do that, and I'm going to give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> what was the book? Take a wild fucking guess. Was it the Raven one? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. I, I figured, but I didn't know if maybe you've already shared that one before. With no. Her. No, I have not. Okay. But how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, today is a great day. Like, it's sunny. It's just... It's not scalding hot like it has been. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> a little warm, but it's not, like, miserable outside. Yeah. And it's bright and sunny and just a nice day overall. I think we've got good vibes here today, and we're about to take it right down the <laughs> <middle. laughs> Yeah, because uh, why is that? Because <laughs> <laughs> our topic is true crime. <laughs> yes. And we haven't done that in a while, actually. It so, has been a hot minute. You know, we're here to bring down the vibes. I can't even remember the last case I talked about. I can't either. It had to have been either the Toy Box Killer or the Sylvia Likens case. I can't remember which was the one I did most recently. I don't either. But what are we drinking? So we are drinking a drink we like. So I am drinking the Stella Rose or Stella Rosa Stella Peach wine. Nice. And I made a pitcher of tea and I put whiskey on it. <laughs> I went with an Italian wine because when we get to my case, my case is very Italian. <laughs> oh, I did not theme mine <laughs> to my case. So <laughs> I didn't know that was something we were doing. <laughs> no, it's just because I chose to do that because I was like, why not? <laughs> Cheers. Mostly whiskey. Nice. <laughs> it's very peachy, but not like overly sweet peachy it's very like here well we'll do our thing okay it's just whiskey and lemon <laughs> fair warning 
I like whiskey now. Or I'm teaching myself to like whiskey now. <laughs> well, there is a shot right there whenever you want it. I know. Apparently, after I just <laughs> went on a whole rant, y'all saw it on TikTok, if you saw the TikTok, about how you don't, <laughs> how you shouldn't oh, take yeah. shots of whiskey, <laughs> but here we are. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I wasn't even thinking of that TikTok. It was just the only thing I had. I was like, ooh, shots. Now it's ironic because I'm making her do a shot. I'm not making her. You don't have to. I'll do them both. I mean, I'll do a shot with you. Just let me know whenever you want to do it. Maybe we'll do it in between our cases. Maybe. Also, uh, hers is very short and apparently is not even true crime. You're in our true crime. I was about to get into that, okay? (laughs) So, yes. So, Brittany did not (laughs) follow the assignment. I'm a rule breaker today. I got whiskey shots and not a true crime. Okay, here's the thing. So I had come across this story and it was something I never heard of. And with the name, with what the name of it and what it's known as, I did think true crime. Like Mm -hmm. I thought it was going to be a true crime case. And then I got into it and it ends up, that's not what it ended up being. But I also could think there's wiggle room and room to argue there. Okay. So that's all I'll say, but it's also not a lot known, and you'll see why when we get to the time period for all of these reasons and what little is known. So my case is going to be very short. I only have about three pages, which normally on average we try to have like five to seven. So I'm coming in very light and then also not even the right genre. <laughs> so basically I'm just going to tell you kind of a sad story, I guess. Okay. <laughs> So whenever you're ready, anything else to discuss or just jump on into it? Just like you, you have a doozy. I do have a doozy. I've got 15 pages of notes. So <laughs> I guess I should just jump right in because also I'm really curious about whatever the fuck you've got going on over there. <laughs> <laughs> Put me on the spot. Okay. So this is known as the Lost Children of the Alleghenies. So with a title like that, I was like, ooh, true crime. Yeah. It's not really. Okay. And I'm sorry. But, again, I that's where you would be like, mm, is it, though? So this is a story of Joseph and George Cox. They are now known as the Lost Children of the Alleghenies. So it's these two kids who became known as that. They lived with their parents in a cabin in the heavily forested Allegheny Mountains of southern Pennsylvania. They were five and seven years old. So George was seven, Joseph was five. Okay. So this took place in 1856. Oh, okay. So it's very old. Yes. Which is where, you know, we gotta kind of take everything with, like... Yeah, pre-Civil War. It's just, it was a very, very long time ago, and that's why I'm hesitant to say this isn't true crime, because Mm -hmm. the way it ends, it's like, I don't know, man, I still feel a little weird about some people involved. Yeah, okay. So here we go. On April 24th, 1856, on, like, this evening, Samuel Cox, their father, he was out hunting in the forest for their supper for the night, like he normally does, but he was unsuccessful, and so he went home this day empty-handed. As they were all, the family was back in their cabin, possibly sitting down to eat whatever they had, or just, like, doing their daily chores or whatever. Again, again, I just want to preface, this is 1856, take all these details, like, as this is what I saw on, like, multiple sites so this is, seems to be the consensus of the story so anyway, so they were all just sitting down there all together they heard their dog sport barking he was coming from the woods and it was barking so samuel the father assumed this could that be either really good or really bad it's like oh dog's barking this is there's a threat ooh, or ooh, dog's barking there could be food exactly that's what the dad's mind frame went he assumed the dog had that like treat a squirrel because that was primarily the dog's job was to help mm-hmm. provide food for the family and then also i'm sure protection because they lived out in the middle of the woods but again back in the day who there probably wasn't that many people threatening them or whatever but i digress so the dad thought this dog had treat a squirrel so he and they wanted it for dinner since he was unsuccessful like i said so he grabbed his rifle to, and he just like went after the barking from the woods he was gone for less than two hours, and then when he returned, the children were gone. Oh, shit. Yes. What happened to the mom? Because wasn't she with them, too? That's a detail that's... I get what happened with her. Like, I have details on it, but I read that the family was together in the cabin, but then also that when she saw... Here, you'll see. Okay. Um, again, I say this is in the 1800s, so details are bound to be lost, uh, but this is the most reconstructed tale. It's said that while no one knows precisely what happened between the time that Samuel left to when he returned, it's thought that the two young boys must have left to follow their father. Like, they thought, oh, 
let's go help dad get food, you know, because that was probably something they did a lot with him. The mother, Susanna, yeah, like seeing, training. yeah, the mother who was named Susanna, seeing that they were all gone, she, it's said that people just thought that she thought Samuel had taken them with him. So maybe she was out like in the garden or something or, but they were all at the cabins. Like, I think what it means is no one was off the premises so that they were all still there. Oh. But maybe she was like in a different room where she was outside tending at whatever you do in 1856. See, I don't when know. When you said like they were all together at the cabin, I was like picturing them all sitting in like the family room or something. And then like the barking so the dad ran off and then the mom and the two kids are like. I took all it together. just like they're all on the premises, but okay. I don't imagine it was a very big cabin or anything. But maybe if something happened on one side, you wouldn't necessarily see on the other Mm -hmm. so I just read like it's generally thought that she thought the dad took the kids with him okay and so she was like oh okay it's fine because again I'm assuming that's just something they normally did it's like Mm -hmm. he took the boys and she tended to the cabin is what I would assume but it wasn't until that Samuel returned home that she realized the truth and by then they'd already been gone for some time so he came back from the woods without her two kids and she was like where are the boys, you know, what the fuck? And then he was like, where are the boys? What the fuck? They're not at the cabin. And that's when they kind of, like, realized something was wrong. (laughs) Oh, shit. Yeah. (laughs) If you don't have the boys, and I don't have the boys. (laughs) Who has the boys? Samuel and Susanna began immediately searching for the boys, calling out in the hopes that they would hear their voices. So they just, like, yelled and, like, all in this forest. Again, they were... it seems like it was pretty deep into the forest, especially back then. Nothing was too well civilized or populated yeah. or anything. But they still tried and just screaming and hoping that the boys would hear their voices and come. But there never was a reply. I mean, even now with things being more civilized and like there's more infrastructure and more roads and forests have been, you know, made smaller. You could get lost in the woods easily with... Oh, yeah, you definitely could. And this, especially being a mountainous forest, Mm -hmm. it's just even harder and scarier, I imagine. Samuel went for help from his nearest neighbors, and within a a day, nearly a thousand people were searching around the Cox's cabins for the boys. Some came from as far as 50 miles away, which in 1856 was a pretty big deal. That's far. To come 50 miles into this mountainous woods to search for these boys. Dude, it's got to be a whole trip for me to even drive 50 miles. I'm yeah. Like, it's got to be for a good reason. Right? Like, and the, no, like, they probably either just walked or horse or carrot. Like, it's a big deal. In the evenings, the searches lit fires and carried torches in the hopes that the boys would see the lights and come to them, along with shouts for them by their name. But they never, still never found anything. The search kept expanding day by day. Near the Cox's cabin was a stream that was swollen with the melting spring snow and the searchers fully believed that there was no way the boys could have crossed it without drowning. So it was just out of the question from people's minds. I thought minds. that you were going to say that there's no way they could have drowned. I was like... No, no, no. They, they <laughs> could cross this stream without drowning. Yeah. Again, because they were only five and seven years old. They were just like, it's too high. There's absolutely no way. I, the water was probably freezing. And yeah. I, typically streams do pick up current pretty easily. Yeah. And especially with all the melting snow, it was just adding more and more to it by every day hold on no not like hold on hold on but like i had a thought and i wanted to fact check it okay (laughs) okay so i was right (laughs) you are more likely to drown in a stream or a river than you are the ocean i have heard that i think just because of the currents and all that yeah yeah and there's more rocks and there's more and if you hit your head on anything Knock yourself unconscious. Uh, very bridge to Terabithia. But I wanted to fact check, because I was about to say, I was like, and I'm pretty sure you're more likely to drown in a stream than you are the ocean. But then I was like, wait, let me fact check. Let me, <laughs> let me fact this. check that before <laughs> I just say that out loud. <laughs> but yes, confirmed. Confirmed. Um, so then they thought, okay, well, since they probably couldn't have crossed this without harming themselves or drowning, they thought of it kind of as like a barrier. For the property then they're like okay well this is our search barrier so this helps narrow it down um but despite even having that they still found nothing of these boys but they kept searching there was a common fear that they were afraid if they kept searching the length of the stream that they might find the drowned bodies of the two boys so that was definitely something that became more and more likely as the days went on but they still never found anything no bodies no, no clothing nothing 
So within two days of their disappearance, the searchers came to a conclusion. They were, one, unlikely to find the boys alive, and that the nights were still cold at this time of the year, that they had searched far enough now that if the boys were still breathing, they should have found them by any logical sense. Like, we should have found them by now if they were alive, so that means they're probably dead when we do find them. So they were just like, these are the facts as far as we can tell. As the searches continued to come up empty-handed, suspicion then began to fall on Samuel and Susanna, the parents. So the community's earlier outpouring of sympathy and support quickly turned to accusation. With each passing day, it began to look like the parents murdered their own children and made up the disappearance story, all to extort money and sympathies from neighbors. The searchers who were helping the Cox family search the forest for the missing boys now turned their attentions to their cabin and the surrounding land. They turned the cabin and surrounding lands upside down, convinced that they would find the boys' hidden bodies. They went so far as to even tear up the floorboards of their cabin. But still, they didn't find anything. So they destroyed this family who lost their kids. They're like, we're gonna tear up your fucking cabin now. And still didn't find anything. It's a pretty big reach for literally no evidence that pointed to them whatsoever. 1856, man. <laughs> <laughs> Very much... Uh... Oh my god, I, can't, I lost the word. Mob mentality. Yes, <laughs> mob mentality. Group think. Yeah, I, was, I think I was trying to think of group think. So, normally, again, especially given the time period, this is probably where it just would have ended, and it would have been just an unsolved case back in the day. But then a man had a prophetic dream, and it changed oh, things. Oh, did he? And then it changed <laughs> things. So, this happened, this was ten days after they went missing. So, Jacob Dilbert was a farmer who lived pretty near to where the boys had gone missing. One day, he just told his wife that he, quote, wished he could dream of where the boys were located. Then, on May 2nd, that's what he did. A silly, funny, goofy mood. (laughs) In his dream... How much you want to bet it was from God? In his dream, he was walking along a path through the woods. He crossed a stream on a fallen log, passed a dead deer and a child's shoe, and found the boys at the foot of a broken birch. That was his dream. Okay. Uh, He woke up the following morning. He thought nothing of it because he was just like, it was wishful thinking that because he literally had just told his wife like, oh, I wish I could help this family. I wish I could just dream of where these boys were. Um, And then this exact thing happened. So naturally he was probably just on his mind before falling asleep. And he's like, this means nothing. We go back to our psychology episode when I talk about like dream theory that, you know, if you spend a lot of time thinking about something one day, like your brain. It's just gonna, you know. Input it. Give you a little, little story. But he continued to have the same dream for multiple nights. By this point, it seemed like this particular dream was something more to him and he kind of couldn't ignore it anymore. So Jacob uh, convinced his brother-in-law to go looking for the landmarks that Jacob could remember from his dream. Now, I read that, but I did read a couple of times that he ended up just telling his brother-in-law about the dream, and then his brother-in-law was the one who knew where these landmarks were. And so he was like, I'll take you. So I saw both, whichever one you want to take, either... He convinced his brother Paul to go and help him, or his brother-in-law was like, oh, I know where that's at. Whatever. Creepily enough, they found every single one. So, they found the trail through the woods, the fallen log that crosses the stream, the dead deer, the child's shoe, and in the roots of a broken birch tree, they also found the bodies of Joseph and George Cox. He murdered them. Their bodies were found on May 8th, 1856, 13 days after the two boys had gone missing. Now, naturally, suspicion probably would have fallen on Jacob, the farmer, because how would he have known all that? (laughs) Which is my thinking. Uh, I'm like, he's the one who did it. He did it. (laughs) Him and his brother-in-law. Right? That's why I'm like, isn't it true crime? But, however, it's said that both children appeared to have died from exposure, most likely hypothermia. So this is what most people could discern. Uh, They must have left to follow their father, ended up getting lost in the woods. They did make it across the stream, which would have put them on the outside of all of the bounds of the searches that people were doing. But then they likely couldn't have found their way back towards the cabin. Eventually, they laid down among the broken birch, um, and then they likely died from hypothermia. Their bodies found over a week later. So, not a happy ending at all. Still technically not true crime, unless you're like, I don't trust that farmer, which is kind of where I stand. Okay, well, maybe if they even, <laughs> maybe if they did die of exposure and there was no evidence of, like, 
homicide, he still could have, like, taken them out there to die of Exactly. Exposure. Like, they, they could have, like, had them for the 13 days or, like, 10 days, like, kidnapped them or something. Like, anything could have happened because, again, it was 1856. And I doubt the how much, you know, post-mortem testing did they do on these bodies back then. They were probably just like, oh, yeah, they died of exposure. Like, we don't know. They didn't test anything. Were they poisoned? I probably won't know because they yeah. probably didn't test for that or something. Like, maybe no external wounds. But I don't know. It still feels icky to me. Yeah, that Jacob guy is sus. <laughs> I think, I think extremely sus. But the community just kind of moved on the... The farmer's weird dream gave them this weird closure that I guess they needed, and it also helped the cement um, this area entail into a local legend, which I also just hate when dead kids are involved in something that's like local legend, Mm -hmm. but that is sadly what this quote-unquote case is known as. It is a legend in the area of Pennsylvania because the lost children of the Alleghenies are still remembered today. Visitors stop by to leave flowers on their graves. In 1906, on the 50th anniversary of their um, sad fate, the nearby community of Pavia, Pennsylvania, began taking donations, and in 1910, they erected a monument on the spot where the boys were found. This monument does still stand today in the Pennsylvania's Blue Knob State Park, along with a plaque detailing the story of Jacob's weird dream. So not only did these boys get, like, this weird legend, so did this farmer, which is also icky to me if he is... Yeah, guilty he's the one in a who way. Did it. It's like they made him also famous for having a dream. And I'm just like, I really just get bad vibes from this guy. I don't know. But one of the monuments reads Joseph S. Cox, aged five years, six months, nine days. George S. Cox, aged seven years, one month, and ten days. Children of Samuel and Susanna Cox. And then to add a touch of paranormal to my not a true crime story, many who visit the location of the monuments reported strange occurrences, leading them to believe that the boys' spirits still haunt the place where they died. Some said they've heard children's voices and footsteps. Others claim to have seen children's footprints on the ground. Which, you know, if they are murdered, I wouldn't doubt that they would still be pissed. And that's all I have (laughs) on this story. Again, my not... Really a true crime, very short case, but I don't know. I still don't trust the farmer. Yeah. If I'm being honest. So that's why I'm like, could it be true crime? A little bit of a stretch, but I'll take it. It works. Cool. I, like I said, I went into it thinking it was going to be like a murder story. Yeah. And then it was like, and they died of exposure. And I'm like, so we're just trusting the guy who said he just yes. spilt this very detailed dream. Like, I believe in prophet dreaming, but that, it just, mm, I don't know. I don't know. A little mm. too coincidental. A little too specific. Yeah. And so, like, originally I was like, okay, the dead deer, maybe they were hunting deer and they accidentally shot the boys. And so he, like, had to cover it up, finding their shoe next to a dead deer. But then I, I didn't see anything about a bullet hole or anything. And I'm like... Again, but how closely did they look? Again, I don't know. It was 1856, but mm-hmm. I don't know. You could come up with so many theories, but I just thought it was interesting, at least, and sad for those two little boys. Yeah. Either way. And the poor family. Who's... I know. They had their house tore up, and and again, like, you know, we don't know. Maybe the parents were guilty, but they didn't have the weirdly specific dream of where their kids' bodies were next to a dead deer carcass. So I don't I, I don't think the family was guilty. <laughs> yeah, I don't think Samuel and Susanna had anything to do with this. <laughs> now, Jacob, on the other hand, I'm, I'm really looking at him. <laughs> yeah, I really just get, I get the ick. Get the ick. Get the ick. See, so yeah, that was really short. I told you it would be. I'm <laughs> yeah, sorry. <okay. laughs> but I guess it works out since yours is like double a normal length. Yeah. So. <laughs> well, this is pretty on par for me. <laughs> Yeah, your cases may average five to seven pages. Mine tend to average about, like, 12. I guess that's fair. <laughs> I was speaking for me more so than you, I guess. Are we doing a shot? or? Oh, I mean, if you want. I know mine was really short. <laughs> we can wait until you finish, like, a glass of wine if you need to, or if you just want to go and do a shot before you do your case. All right, we'll finish that glass of wine. Okay. Okie dokie. Mine is, like I said, kind of paired my wine with it to be Italian, and it's very topical because three days ago was the anniversary of, or the 25th anniversary of his murder at the time of recording. Yeah. 
Yeah, I know actually <clears throat> nothing about this, so I'm pretty interested. Yes, so today I will be talking about the life and death of fashion designer Gianni Versace and the life and death of the man who murdered him, the spree killer Andrew Cunanan. Cunanan. Okay. So Giovanni Maria, or Gianni Versace, was born in the city of Reggio Calabria on December 2nd, 1946, and grew up with his elder brother Santo Versace and younger sister Donatella Versace, along with their father and his mother Francesca, who was a make a uh, dressmaker and he also had an older sister tina who died at age 12 because of an improperly treated tetanus infection oh that's sad that is sad versace began his apprenticeship at a young age at his mother's sewing business which employed up to a dozen seamstresses he became interested in architecture after working there but then he moved to milan at 26 to work in fashion design so he was like fashion and then he was like architecture and then he was like no fashion <laughs> In 1973, he became the des the designer of Byblos, or Byblos, a successful Jenny's youthful line. And in 1977, he designed um, Complice, which was another more, exper more experimental line for Jenny. And then Jenny is an Italian ready-to-wear manufacturer created by Arnaldo Girombelli. Backed by the Girombellis, an Italian fashion family, Versace established his own company, Gianni Versace SPA. Okay. And he created, established that in 1978. His brother Santo served as CEO and his sister Donatello was a designer and the vice president of the company. Donatello's purview extended to creative oversight where she acted as a key consultant to Gianni and Gianni would also employ Donatello's husband, Paul Beck, as the menswear director. He presented his first signature collection for women at the Palazzo della Permanente Art Museum of Milan. His Fancy. first fashion show followed in September of that same year, and then his first boutique was opened in Milan's Via della Spiga in 1978 as well. After opening his Milan boutique in 1978, Versace quickly became a sensation on the international fashion scene. His designs employed vivid colors, bold prints, and sexy cuts, which were a refreshing contrast to the prevailing taste for muted colors and more simplicity. His most famous designs included sophisticated bondage gear, polyvinyl chloride baby doll dresses, and silver mesh togas. What a variety. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. His aesthetic, which combined luxur uh, luxurious classicism um, with overt sexuality, attracted much criticism in addition to praise. Um, Sounds about right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> Back in the 70s and yeah. early 80s, yeah, people were not happy. You're either not happy or really happy. <laughs> <laughs> he is quoted as saying, I don't believe in good taste, which reflected in his, quote, brazen defiance of the rules of fashion, unquote. Um, a saying referencing Versace's rivalry with uh, Giorgio Armani was, Armani dresses the wife, Versace dresses the mistress. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Unfazed by such criticism, good for you, King. Uh, Versace staged his seasonal fashion shows like rock concerts at his lavish design headquarters in Milan with groupies and paparazzi awaiting the arrival of like him and like his celebrity friends and all the clothes and everything such as Elton John and Madonna and then his loyal models like Cindy Crawford, Linda Evangelista, Christy Turlington, and Naomi Campbell. What a group. <laughs> and like and maybe he's like one of the reasons it is but like nowadays like you want your fashion to be weird and yeah not like not classic or the mainstream get the praise you want to be weird and stand out so like maybe this was the start of it i guess but... he really was like a trailblazer because <clears throat> yeah. those models i just listed um they were paid such high salaries that the press dubbed them supermodels that's the first time that supermodels had ever been used i mean the the names yeah they are definitely the og supermodels <laughs> Versace became known for employing celebrities in his marketing campaigns and seating them in the front rows of his fashion shows, and he was the first to do that. And okay. people do that all the time now. Yeah. Very cool. Versace was credited with turning the fashion world into the high-powered celebrity besotted industry that it remains to the present day. There you go. Among Versace's most famous innovations was his 1982 invention of a type of super light chain mail called Oriton, which became a signature material in his outfits. Um, his suits were inspired by his experience in female tailoring, departing from masculine Seville Row models by crafting suits 
that accentuated the male form and insisted on men as sex objects. Very nice. Yeah, we love to see it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> love that for him. Versace was very proud of his southern Italian heritage and infused his designs with motifs inspired by historical fashion and art movements, especially Greco-Roman art. This is evident in the company's logo, the Medusa head, and recurring motifs like the Greek key. He also allowed his love for contemporary art to inspire his work, creating graphic prints based on the famous uh, based on the art of famous pop artists Roy Lichtenstein and Andy Warhol. In 1982, Versace expanded the business into jewelry and housewares, designing luxury furnishings, china, and textiles for the home. He was unusual in retaining complete creative control over all aspects of his company. In 1989, the firm expanded into Hot Couture, or Haute, I think it's Hot, yeah. H-A-U-T? Yeah. I was like, that's how I've always said it in my head, but when I read it out loud, I was like... I have heard people say it both, but I think it's supposed to be Hot. Yeah, Hot Couture, with the launch of Atelier Atelier Versace. Throughout his career, Versace was a prolific costume designer for stage productions and performing artists. He stated, quote, for me, the theater is liberation, unquote. And his designs were well served by his penchant for bold colors, drapery, embellishment, and an encyclopedic knowledge of fashion history. He was a collaborator at the La Scala Theater Ballet in Milan and designed the costumes for the Strauss Ballet, Joseph's Legend. I really don't know how to say that. Um, In 1982, (laughs) it's fine. (laughs) It's all one word, but it reads as Joseph's, Joseph's Legend. (laughs) <laughs> We're going to go with it. In 1982, and Donizetti's Don Pascal. He also designed the costumes for five uh, Behart ballet productions, uh, Dionysus in 1984, Lita and the Swan, 1987, Malraux ou la Metamorphoses de Doux, 1986, Chaka Zulu in 1989, and the Ballet du XX Michele. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. In 1990, he designed the costumes for the San Francisco Opera's production of Capriccio. Um, Versace designed Michael Jackson and Paul McCartney for their 1983 Say 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 video and Elton John's costumes for his 1992 world tour. Makes sense. I feel like Elton John and Versace have very... I was going to say, I feel like he's been pretty, pretty big with Versace for a long time. Yeah. Versace met his partner, Antonio... Uh, D'Amico, a model in 1982, and their relationship lasted until Versace's murder, so they were together up until he died. During this time, Versace was diagnosed with HIV. Uh, In 1993, uh, Versace was diagnosed with a rare inner ear cancer. Um, He successfully beat the cancer, but after that, he did start passing more of his company's responsibilities onto Donatella and Santo and kind of Took a step back and was like, I mean, that's let me fair. chill. <laughs> yeah. Fair. He's been doing the most. <laughs> <laughs> he has been doing the most. It was time for him to take a little breather. On the morning of July 15th, 1997, Versace took a walk on Ocean Drive to retrieve his morning magazines from like the breakfast cafe. Usually Versace would have an assistant walk from his home to the nearby news cafe to get his magazines. But on this occasion, he just happened to decide to go himself. Versace had returned and was climbing the steps of his Miami Beach mansion when a man dressed in a gray t-shirt, black shorts, a white hat, and carrying a backpack shot him in the head at point-blank range with a 40 caliber Taurus PT-100, which is a semi-automatic pistol. Mm -hmm. He was pronounced dead at Jackson Memorial Hospital at 9.21 a.m. He was 50 years old at the time of his death. Versace's murder was witnessed by his former UK senior stylist, Dean Aslett, who was on vacation in South Beach, Miami, and had partied with Versace a few days prior. Versace was murdered by Andrew Cunanan, a spree killer who had earlier murdered four other men. Versace was cremated, and his ashes were returned to the family's estate near uh, Chernobyl and buried in the family vault at Moltrazio Cemetery near Lake Como. Versace's funeral procession, held at Milan Cathedral, was attended by over 2,000 people, including Carolyn Bissett Kennedy, Naomi Campbell, Elton John, and Diana, Princess of Wales, who was killed in a car accident nearly a month later. In September 1997, the estate announced that Versace's brother Santo would serve as the new CEO of Gianni Versace SPA, while Versace's sister Donatella would become the new head of design. In his will, Versace left 50% of his fashion empire to his niece, Allegra Versace, 
She and her younger brother, Daniel, inherited Versace's rare artwork collection, and then when Allegra inherited her stake, or Ale Allegra inherited her stake worth approximately $500 million when she turned 18 in 2004. Oh, shit. I think at the time of his death, his empire was worth $807 million. Versace's That's so sad, though. He's only 50? Yeah, he was only 50. Versace's work was honored by a posthumous retrospective held from December 1997 to March 1998 at the Costume Institute of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. So that is Versace. Okay. Very sad. It's very sad, but we're not done. I mean, I figured. <laughs> yeah, that was not 15 pages. No, that you flew through. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I went really fast last week. So. You did. <laughs> okay. Andrew Philip Cunanan was born August 31st, 1969 in National City, California to Modesto Pete uh, Dungal Cunanan and Mary Ann uh, Shalasi. Modesto was serving in the United States Navy in the Vietnam War at the time of his son's birth, and he had four older siblings. Cunanan lived with his family in National City and attended uh, Bonita Vista Middle School. In 1981, his father enrolled him in the Bishop's, Bishop School, an independent day school located in the affluent La Jolla neighborhood of San Francisco. There is where he met his lifelong best friend, Elizabeth Liz Cote. At school, he was remembered as being very bright and very talkative, and he tested with an IQ of 147. See how that paragraph kind of... <laughs> <laughs> does it, it does sound familiar. <laughs> Like all of them. As a teenager, Cunanan developed a reputation as a prolific liar. He would make <laughs> great. Yep. <laughs> he would make things up about his family and personal life, and then he would change his appearance according to what he felt was most attractive at the time. Now, this next sentence, I will explain why I phrased it this way. It's because I couldn't really find what it meant by that. So, Cunanan identified as gay in high school when he began sleeping with wealthy older men. Okay. Now, me saying he identified as gay in high school, I'm unclear on whether or not that's when he realized he was gay and started to identify as gay, or if that's when he came out, so I just kind of stuck with what it said, because I wasn't sure if that was like, oh, he came out in high school and then started sleeping with wealthy older men, or if he realized he was gay and started sleeping with wealthy older men, like, I'm not really Did he sure. continue that? I was I, like, does it have anything to do with him being a liar, though? That he was he just in it for the money? That's a good question. Okay, that's what I'm wondering. It's just if he got so good at lying and that being his personality, I wonder if. But but if there was never anyone else, then I guess I mean, it doesn't matter. He had like sugar daddies essentially, but he never really. It never seemed that he was like manipulating them. Like he. Okay. Was, I mean, he he was definitely like they knew he was with him for for the money for money. Okay. But they were okay with that. Like, he had multiple boyfriends who were, would, like, give him gifts and give him money and... Okay. I, I was one. I was just curious if yeah. it was part of his pathological lying. And he was voted least likely to be forgotten. Why is that a category? Because yeah. then it just makes people do shit. <laughs> um, after graduating from high school in 1987, he enrolled at the University of California, San Diego, or UC San Diego, and majored in American History. Okay. <laughs> Weird. Yeah, it didn't really make sense, but I was like, all right. Um, in 1988, when Cunanan was 19, his father moved to the Philippines to evade arrest for embezzlement. Great. Yep. And then Cunanan had begun frequently frequenting local gay clubs and restaurants, and that same year his father fled, his mother, who was deeply religious, learned about his sexual orientation. Mm. During an argument, Cunanan threw his mother against a wall, dislocating her shoulder. Also, not none good, of this is good. None of that is good <laughs> on anyone's part that's involved in this. No, yeah. Later examination of his behavior indicates that he may have suffered from antisocial, antisocial personality disorder characterized by a lack of remorse and empathy. In 1989, Cunanan dropped out of UC San Diego and settled in the Castro District of San Francisco, which was a very prolific center for gay culture, mm -hmm. and moved in with Liz and her boyfriend, Phil Merrill. Cunanan continued his practice of befriending wealthy older men and reportedly began creating violent pornography. Another tick in the list of checks if you're looking for signs. That... Get your bingo cards. <laughs> 
He also frequented the Hillcrest and Lajala neighborhoods of San Diego, as well as Scottsdale, Arizona. Um, he is also believed to have been dealing drugs, including prescription opioids, cocaine, and marijuana. His time in San Francisco is where everything really seemed to start escalating for Cunanan. Allegedly, October of 1990 is the first time Cunanan met Versace when Versace was in town to fit costumes that he designed for the San Francisco opera production that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Although Versace's family continues to deny that the two men ever met. In December 1995, Cunanan met David Madsen, a a Minneapolis architect uh, in a San Francisco bar. They began a long-distance relationship shortly after, but Madsen ended the relationship in the spring of 1996, telling friends he sensed something shady about Cunanan. And then Cunanan told his friends that Madsen was the love of his life. Okay. Yep. It's a little troubling. (laughs) Yeah, when one person is describing the other one as the love of their life, and that other person is calling the other one shady, it's... It's not good. It's not good. In September of 1996, Cunanan broke up with Norman Blatchford, or Blockford, B-L-A-C-H-F-O-R-D, a wealthy older man who had been hosting and financially supporting him. He soon maxed out his credit cards after he broke off his relationship with Norman. Cunanan's close friend, Jeffrey Trail, a former naval officer, had told his former roommate, Michael Williams, that Cunanan had begun selling drugs again, and he also began using especially methamphetamine. Methamphetamine. Not good. It's like the worst one you guys can use. Yeah. Why does everyone use meth? Stop doing meth. Stop doing meth. Smoke a little weed. Please. (laughs) I I I beg you, actually. (laughs) Chill out. (laughs) Just smoke some weed, it'll be fine. But stay off of meth. Stay off of meth. Do not do meth. Meth is just, meth is the worst. Literally, it doesn't even sound good. Followed shortly by heroin, followed shortly by cocaine. Honestly, do cocaine before you do meth. Do cocaine before you do meth. (laughs) But marijuana, just just do weed. Just do weed. (laughs) You heard it here first. (laughs) By April 1997, friends reported Cunanan was abusing painkillers and alcohol. Later that month, he told his friends that he was leaving San Diego for Minneapolis to take care of some business matters with Trail. I don't like that. <laughs> you won't. Oh, great. Um, who had recently distanced himself from Cunanan. I wonder why. Trail expected Cunanan to return to San Francisco upon leaving Minneapolis. Before Cunanan's visit, Trail told his sister that he did not want Andrew to come. I don't blame him. (laughs) Upon arriving there on April 25th, Cunanan stayed with Madsen, his ex-boyfriend, and a mutual friend of his and Trail's. Okay. In Madsen's apartment. On April 26th, Cunanan stayed in Trail's apartment while Trail was out of town with his boyfriend, John Hackett. The following afternoon, Trail told Hackett that he needed to have a pretty important conversation with Cunanan. So that was on April 26th. So on April 27th, the next day, Cunanan's killings began in Minneapolis with the murder of his friend, 28-year-old Jeffrey Trail. After an earlier argument in Trail's apartment, Cunanan stole Trail's gun and took it to David Madsen's apartment. Cunanan called Trail from Madsen's apartment to come and retrieve his gun. Trail left his apartment to see Cunanan shortly after 9 p.m., and it is believed that he likely arrived at Madsen's apartment at 9.45. On arrival, Cunanan beat Trail to death with a hammer in front of David Madsen. On April 29th, one of Madsen's co-workers, concerned about his absence from work, visited his apartment to check on him. They discovered Trail's body rolled in a rug and placed behind a sofa. Trail's watch had stopped at 9.55 p.m., and that is believed by authorities to be the time of Trail's murder. Great. Yep. Also, if anyone that I don't want to see stole a gun from me and was like, (laughs) hey, come get your gun, I would simply just not go get my gun. I would simply not do that. I would just move (laughs) and never speak to this person again. Like, no fault to this victim, but I simply would not. I, I would... If it was that important for me to have a gun and it got stolen, I would just go get a new one. Especially if I'm done with this person. If I've already distanced myself from them, told my sister I did not want them around me, we had already gotten into an argument. Follow your gut. Yeah, poor Jeffrey Trail. Yeah, that sucks. sucks. So. Especially when that used to be your friend. Yeah. 
David Madsen, 33, was Cunanan's second victim. Uh, saw that coming. Yeah. Okay. Authorities believe Madsen remained in his apartment with Cunanan two days after Trail's murder. As one neighbor witnessed both men in the apartment elevator on April 28th, and another neighbor witnessed them walking Madsen's dog on April 29th. Investigators treated Madsen as a suspect in Trail's murder, but Madsen's family insisted he was held hostage by Cunanan. I was about to say, was it that ever what everything ended up leading to, maybe, is that he was held there against his will? I believe so. Okay. They can't really prove it. Right. They can't, like, I mean, Cunanan did murder him, which is, you know, good evidence that Madsen wasn't working with Cunanan, but there's no definitive but I believe that's that he what I was, would like to think. He was being held hostage and Kanan was forcing him to like, you know, th- probably threatening him. Yeah. You know, he just watched him beat Like their... you're in this now too. He and... watched his ex boyfriend beat their mutual friend to death with a hammer. Yeah. Like on May second, they were seen north of Minneapolis driving in Madsen's Jeep and eating lunch together in a bar. The next morning, Madsen's body was found on the east shore of Rush Lake near Rush City, Minnesota, with gunshot wounds to the head and back from a 40 caliber Taurus PT-100 semi-automatic pistol, which was the gun Kunanen took from Trail's apartment. Both of these murders seem to have motives and personal reasons. Mm -hmm. A friend who distanced himself, an ex-boyfriend who was kind of caught in the middle. Now with his next murder is where it gets fuzzy, because it's unclear whether he knew the victim or not. So there's always been the question of if all five of these murders were random, if it started out personal and then he devolved, or if all five could be personal. And it's one of those things that we can only speculate about. Okay. So this next uh, murder happened on May 3rd. So he drove to Chicago, Illinois, and killed 72-year-old Lee Miglin, a prominent real estate developer. He bound Miglin's hands and feet and wrapped his head with duct tape, then stabbed Miglin more than 20 times with a screwdriver, slit his throat with a hacksaw, and stole his car. Jesus Christ. Miglin's family maintains that the killing was random, but former FBI agent Greg McCrary argues that it is unlikely that Cunanan would have bound and tortured Miglin without some motive because... That MO is especially personal, not only the binding, but stabbing. Stabbing is usually considered a very personal way to kill, along with, like, strangling. I was literally about to say, that shit was personal. Yeah. If I've ever heard. If it was random, you'd just shoot someone, get it over with. But, I don't know, that seems very personal. Well, I have a theory at the end, but I also want to hear your theory also. Okay, I don't know if I'll have one. Okay. (laughs) Um, On May 9th in... Pinsville Township, New Jersey, at Finns Point National Cemetery, Cunanan shot and killed 45-year-old cemetery caretaker William Reese. Later that day, when Reese did not return home for dinner, his wife visited the cemetery to check on him and found the caretaker's office door ajar with the radio playing inside. She then called the police, who found Reese shot in the head by the same Taurus pistol Cunanan used to murder Madsen. Unlike Cunanan's other victims, who... He killed for seemingly personal reasons. Authorities believe that Cunanan murdered Reese just to steal his 1995 red Chevrolet pickup truck. Cunanan used this truck to drive to Florida. On May 12th, Cunanan began staying at the Normandy Plaza Hotel in Miami Beach, Florida, where he paid $29 per night in cash. On June 12th, he was listed on the FBI 10 Most Wanted Fugitives list. Okay. Around 8.45 a.m. on July 15th, Cunanan murdered 50-year-old Gianni Versace on the front steps of Casa Casu Arena, his mansion in Miami Beach. Versace was returning from a visit to the news cafe where he picked up magazines when he was shot once in the back of the head and once in the left cheek with the same Taurus pistol Cunanan used to murder Madsen and Reese. A witness pursued Cunanan but was unable to catch him as he fled into a nearby parking garage. I believe that witness was the former UK stylist. Okay. Um, Versace was pronounced dead at Jackson Memorial Hospital at 9.21 a.m. Responding police found Reese's stolen vehicle in a nearby parking garage. It contained Cunanan's clothes and clippings of newspaper reports about the other murders. Okay. On July 23, 1997, Cunanan's body was found in a luxury houseboat in Miami Beach after a caretaker reported to police hearing a gunshot. He shot himself in the head with the Taurus pistol, the one he stole from the trail, the same one he used to kill Madsen, Reese, and Versace. Cunanan's cremated remains are interred in the mausoleum at Holy Cross Cemetery in San Diego. So, Cunanan's motivation remains unknown. 
At the time of the murders, there was extensive public and press speculation linking the crimes to Kunanin's alleged discovery that he was HIV positive. But that was not true because his autopsy revealed he was HIV negative. Okay. Although police searched the houseboat where Kunana died, he left no suicide note and very few personal belongings. Now, even though we can speculate, as I said earlier, about whether the murders were personal, were personal and then devolved, or if they were all random, I want to focus more on the possible motive behind Versace's murder because that's kind of who we're talking about. Okay. So, Versace's murder was the one that had the most speculation around it, considering who Versace was. It was, right. you know, in the news everywhere. Cunanan was obsessed with the designer and often bragged about his close friendship with Versace. Although this was speculated to be symptomatic of Cunanan's delusions of grandeur, because okay. he did have those as well. He often falsely, often falsely claimed to have met celebrities. However, FBI agents firmly believed that Versace and Cunanan had previously met in said San Francisco, although what their relationship entailed is still a mystery. So they think that Versace and Cunanan must have met at least once or twice, but they don't know that they were. They can't say that they were close friends like Cunanan wanted people to believe. Right. Um, In 1997, Vanity Fair contributing editor Maureen Orth, who wrote the book on which the assassination of Gianni Versace is based, was the first to report that Cunanan and Versace actually had met in San Francisco in 1990. Based on interviews with multiple witnesses uh, to the interaction, Orth described how Cunanan and his friend Eli Gould met the fashion designer in the VIP room of the nightclub Colossus. So this is a, this is going to be a long quote. The designer walked in with an entourage, including Versace's boyfriend Antonio D'Amico and Capriccio choreographer Val Kenny Paroli, who quickly introduced him to a few people. After about 15 minutes of chit-chat and waves of young men eager to meet him, Versace began to survey the room. He noticed Andrew standing with Eli, cocked his head, and walked in their direction. I know you, he said to Andrew. Lago di Como, no? Versace was referring to the house he owned on Lake Como near the Swiss border. Reportedly, he would often use the Lago di Como line when he wanted to strike up a conversation with someone. Andrew was thrilled, and Eli couldn't believe it. That's right, Andrew answered. Thank you for remembering, Senior Versace. Then Andrew introduced Eli to Versace, who made polite talk about whether they had seen the opera. They hadn't. Eli and Andrew then drifted back down to the dance floor. So that is reportedly the first time Andrew Kanaan and Gianni Versace met. Meanwhile... Doug Stubblefield claimed to have seen Versace with Cunanan on a different occasion in San Francisco that fall. He says a chauffeured car containing the duo plus socialite Harry DeWilt pulled up alongside him as he was walking on Market Street one evening. Quote, to show off, Andrew had the car come to the curb and Andrew had, and Andrew and Doug had a conversation, unquote, writes Orth. But Harry DeWilt denied that he ever met Cunanan, let alone traveled, a car, traveled in a car with Versace and Cunanan. To, compl- to complicate things even further, another friend of Cunanan, Stephen Gomer, told Orth that Cunanan had personally introduced him to DeWilt and that the two, two seemed to go back a long way. Okay. So it's either Cunanan and his friend are lying, or Harry is lying, or Doug is lying, and it's like... Yeah. <laughs> it's all... Someone's lying. Someone's lying. <laughs> Gomer also told Orth that on another evening he ran into Cunanan. Cunanan was wearing a tuxedo at the time and claimed to have just come from Capriccio, where he was with Gianni Versace. So another claim. Though Versace's family has maintained in these 25 years following the murder that Gianni never met Andrew Cunanan before. But Orth said that there is no doubt in my mind that those two met. Met. In fact, when news broke that Versace was murdered, Orth was the fir- was one of the first people to have a correct hunch about who the killer was. Um, she had spent the previous months extensively researching the mindset um, and the murder spree of Cunanan, so she was like in all up in Cunanan's business. An intelligent half Filipino college dropout who suffered delusions of grandeur, a drug habit, and dark sexual history. Orth reported that Cunanan had only encountered one of the celebrities he claimed to have met in his delusional monologues, Versace. Okay. Because both Versace and Cunanan are said to have dabbled in sex for hire circles in San Francisco and Miami, there is a slight chance that their orbits also intersected in unreported ways. Because obviously if they met in one of those, they're not, no one's going to say anything. Yeah. 
But even if they did, in fact, only meet once, Cunanan spoke of his friendship with Versace so often that at least three of Cunanan's friends claimed to have told the FBI that after Cunanan went missing following his first four, murder, first four murders about his alleged, alleged relationship with Versace. So he had been talking about it so much that when he went missing, yeah. they were like, Versace is where you need to look next. Even after the 25th anniversary of Versace's murder, which is three days ago at the time of recording, the world is no closer to knowing the real motive behind Versace's murder. The only possible reason that people can think of is volunteered by Bill Hagmeyer, former chief of the FBI's child abuse and serial killer unit, who told Orth that whether or not Versace is personally symbolic, he's the wealthy, high-profile, homosexual success story that Andrew Cunanan was never going to be. Police have said that they do not know why Versace was killed, and Miami Beach Police Chief Richard Barreto said, I don't know that we are ever going to know the answers. When someone like Versace is killed, it's going to be the focus of the world. His murder stunned not only the South East Beach area, but the entire world. And that is why I think so many people focus on and have searched for meaning behind it. Because when something like that happens, you have to think that there must be a reason. That there has to be something there. But if we take away who Versace is, a man shot on the front steps of his home, a uh, murderer runs away, it's kind of like a senseless hit and run. Like, there doesn't have to be a reason behind it. Yeah. Because um, essentially that's what happened. He killed him and ran away. Um, it could be him getting his fame he always wanted. Do what? That could be just his way of getting the fame he always wanted. Yeah, well, Bill Hagmeyer also quoted, now I don't have this in my notes, but he said that um, he was resemblant of the man who tried to assassinate uh, one of the presidents. Um, was it Kennedy? No, Nixon? Basically, Maybe. Basically said the only way Andrew Cunanan was going to get famous was if he got famous in the way that John Hitchcock or Hitch, the guy who tried to assassinate this president was going to get famous. So maybe there is more to it. Maybe Versace was representative of something Cunanan could never be and he was jealous. Um, maybe Cunanan in his delusions felt wronged by Versace in their small meetings. We really may never know and all we can do is speculate. So, my personal speculation is that Cunanan killing Trail and Madsen was personal. Then he began devolving. He found a wealthy older man who was representative of the people he would have relations with, and so that made the murder even more violent because he was seeing the people he was with in Midland. And that made it seem personal even though it really wasn't. It was personal in who Midland represented, but not Midland himself. And then he devolved even further and murdered Reese, so, and that was completely random, and that's what was kind of hinted that he was nearing the end, because it was just getting completely random, and so he found Versace, the man who, was repre who represented everything that Cunanan wanted to be, killed the ideal version of himself before finally taking his own life. And that's my theory, anyways. Yeah, I mean, it's not a bad theory. That's my speculation, but like I said, we may, we may I mean, never know. <laughs> We Truly. probably will never know. At 25 years past, like, we're, we're not going to know. Oh, yeah. And I just, yeah, it's one of those things. And I get, like, your family would be like, no, no, they, they absolutely don't know it either. But, like, my family just doesn't know everyone I've ever met. Yeah. Like, that's my thing. I'm like, but how would you know that for sure? <laughs> Without a doubt. <laughs> like, yeah. He was 50 years old. He didn't check in. <laughs> <laughs> he had his own life. <laughs> so, yeah, it's crazy. But yeah, I definitely think they met more than once, and that's how Versace became who, like, and how Andrew knew that Versace was everything he wanted to be, like, like a because target. they had met. And Versace was, he was a successful story of what Andrew Cunanan could never be. He yeah. had a high, a luxury, high fashion empire, and a very happy relationship with his boyfriend, and a loving family, and... yeah. Things that Andrew could never get. Wow. Well, Did he try? <laughs> <laughs> well, things that Andrew never had. Right. There and at go. this point was never going to get because well, yeah. he was... <laughs> the, the path he went. Yeah, yeah he, took, he sure. took a bad path. Yeah, very interesting. I never knew any of that. Really. Poor Versace. That sucks. Oh, that does suck. I mean, poor all of the people that he killed. Yeah. None of them deserve that. No one deserves to be murdered. Well, this was so fun. <laughs> 
Love true crime. Love true crime. Can we do that <laughs> shot now? Yeah, we can. <laughs> Taylor's favorite, a whiskey shot. Go watch our TikTok where I complain about it. But you got a cute glass. I do have a cute glass. Well, I did a whiskey shot. Wow. Any final thoughts? No, I'm ready to get this over with. <laughs> <laughs> hey, for 15 pages, that was actually not long at all. Yeah. I guess okay. the help that mine wasn't very short, but... That just made me sad all over again. Oh, this is why yeah. I hate for crime. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I know, it's always kind of a downer. It is a downer. Maybe we'll get something fun next week. Hopefully. The drink wheel is ready. All right. Wait, do we do this first or do we... I've forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> you had one shot. <laughs> we spin first. Okay, that's what I. Th okay, <laughs> oh it's not goodness. even the shot. I'm just genuinely so mentally unwell right now. Oh. I came in here like today is a great day. <laughs> now I'm just sad. <laughs> How much an hour can change things? <laughs> okay. Yeah, you know, we haven't done that in a while, have we? No, no. No. So, next week, we'll be talking about culture, travel, and languages. So, basically, that's where I pick a language and teach y'all something, and then Brittany picks either the culture or a place there to travel to and talks about that. Yeah. And we'll be drinking a drink we don't like, so... Not, not yeah. Not so, yeah. Love it. I don't know, what are you going to drink now? Gin and tonic, probably. Gin and tonic's delicious. I hate gin. Every now and then you're like, oh, that's not good. Yeah, well, yeah, because it was probably had a whole bunch of other stuff in it. You had frog jam in there. That probably pretty much overpowered the taste of gin. I just don't like gin at all. Well, I don't like you. Okay, well, that got personal <laughs> real quick. Well, thanks for listening. Um, <laughs> if you would like to find us as a collective on social media we are sip and spin pod um and if you'd like to email us about anything it's sip and spin pod at gmail.com if you would like to find Brittany, her information is or her social media is whimsy dream or whimsy dreams and if you'd like to find me on social media my at is gleam yks on everything but as always the link trees will be down in the description below for you to follow yes uh hopefully this didn't bum you out too much. Thanks for listening. Yeah, thanks for being here with us through this. <laughs> Sorry, mine wasn't technically on topic, but it still feels sad. So I think that hit the mark there. But yeah, we will, I guess we'll be teachers next week. We will teach us some stuff. But we'll about... be sad because we'll be drinking things we don't like. I was like, why well, would we be sad next week? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this was the sad week. But yes, we'll be drinking something we don't like and we will try and teach a, a thing or two about a place <laughs> <laughs> yeah it's, yeah with learning like that coming at you i know you're itching to sip with us <laughs> see, how <did> it? <laughs> see how did it yeah and i hated it tell, tell me it was good no say it was good no just do it no okay well thank you for listening goodbye bye, bye.